So glad to see everybody and welcome to worship. And we begin with our prelude uh, from our wonderful organist, Robert Noble. <laughs>
thanks to Robert for that beautiful gift of music. And welcome everybody to Sunday worship for First Parish in Bedford. We're so glad that you're here. I'm Deb Weiner. I'm the Developmental Director of Faith Development for Children. And I'm coming to you from the main broadcast studios here at First Parish in Bedford. It's great to be inside the church for this worship service. Welcome to those of you who are long timers and who are here for the very first time. Um, I have a couple of announcements to share with you this morning. One is that immediately following the worship service, there will be a meeting around how we can you, you, the vote. Uh, all about how to get involved in the upcoming election. Jerry Ross will be hosting that meeting uh, along with John Gibbons, and we will put a link to that Zoom room, which is different from this one, into the chat. Um, so be ready for that. And of course, if you decide that you would rather stay and talk with your friends. We will also have virtual community hour following the service. Also wanna remind you that COVID-19 testing will continue um, Tuesdays here at the church. Um, this has been a great service to the community, which we are glad for, and that will continue on Tuesday. You do need to um, make an appointment for space um, if you have questions about that, you certainly can contact John Gibbons, our senior minister, who most Tuesdays will greet you if you come to be tested. Um, once again, I uh, want to remind you that starting next week, we will be required to either enter a passcode uh, to come into uh, our gatherings on Zoom or uh, to use a waiting room. So I don't want you to be surprised by that. That is a change that uh, Zoom is requiring. Um, so those are our announcements. Uh, if you are a newbie to First Parish in Bedford, we uh, particularly welcome you. And if you would like uh, information about this congregation, please do visit our website. We're very, very glad that you're here and recognize that one of the blessings of this time is that we have people joining us from not only around uh, the US, but in fact, around the world on some Sundays. So a warm welcome to you all. I want to um, invite us now to uh, join in our unison affirmation. Uh, and our tech wizard, Paul Bradford, is going to share the screen so that we can see that. So here we are, friends. Love is the spirit of this church and service is its law. This is our great covenant to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love and to help one another. El amor es el espíritu de esta iglesia y el servicio es su ley. Este es nuestro gran pacto, vivir juntos en paz, buscar la verdad en el amor y ayudarnos los unos a los otros. Thank you so much. We are blessed to have some wonderful music uh, that we can share with you. Thanks to the great efforts of our beautiful children and Janet Welby, our children's and youth music director. And they have put together a great uh, medley of music, which we're super excited to share with you right now.
Thank you so much. All of the was just wonderful. Uh, and now we have a time for all ages with Annie. Yes, thank you so much, Janet, and to all the families who made that possible. That was a wonderful interlude. So, when I was in seventh grade, I did something very surprising. I joined the cross country team. Now, the reason this was very surprising was because I was a kid who hated running. All year long, I would dread, just dread, the mile run that we had to do for PE, for physical fitness testing. And every year we had to do the mile run twice and I would just think about it and dread it. And cross country races in junior high were two miles, twice as far. So why would a kid who hates running sign up to join the cross country team, you might ask? Because if there was anything I hated more than running, it was being left out from my friends. I had three best friends in sixth grade and we were all going to seventh grade together. Now, Jenny and Catherine had decided they were going to join the cross country team. They were the very athletic ones. But me and Nicole, we were not going to join the cross country team. And that was all right, two and two. But then, Nicole decided to join the cross country team. Now there was no way that I was gonna be the only one of my three best friends who was not on the cross country team. So I came home and I told my mom that I was going to do that. And I think she said something along the lines of, well, but can you run that far? It was a reasonable question. The first time I ran a race, I came in so far behind that my mom had worried I had gotten lost in the cornfields. I was growing up in central Illinois, so we were racing mostly in cornfields. And it is a place that one can get lost. But no, I had not gotten lost. I was just really, really slow. However, I started to slowly and gently improve as one does when one practices. And I started developing a strategy for my races. I would find somebody from my team 
who was just a little bit faster than me, and I would try to stay with them for the race. And this was going pretty well as a strategy. Well, one day late in the fall, late in the season, I was running in a race and I needed a new running buddy. I was sort of outgrowing my, my usual people that I kind of kept my eyes on. And I noticed this eighth grader from my team who I hadn't really noticed before. I kind of thought she was faster than me, but in that race, she seemed to be just the right pace. And I thought, oh, good, a new running buddy. But being me and being very shy as a seventh grader, it's not like I went up to her and said, hi, I'm Annie, can I run with you? I just ran with her without talking to anyone. So I was uh, very surprised the next week when I decided to run with her again. And it seemed so much harder. I was noticing that I was so tired, but you know, this course was supposed to be a very hard course. I had been warned that it was. It was in the woods, there were hills. And because it was in the woods, there also were not as many people there to cheer you on or call out your time as you went by. And so finally I emerged from the woods. And as I came out of the woods and I saw the finish line, I saw the chute up ahead and there it was. And my friend's dad was calling out times. And when he called out the time, I just stopped. Because I thought, I cannot run that fast. And I started walking. And he said, Annie, run! Because the finish line was inside and everyone else was whizzing past me. I got to the chute. I did start running again. And I got to the end. And I had shaved a full two minutes off my time in a two mile race. Anybody who's ever run a two mile race will probably know that that is a lot of time to shave off for a two mile race. What I learned about my running buddy was that the first time I ran with her, she was sick and she wasn't feeling well and she asked the coach, I kind of want to run, but I'm feeling sick, what should I do? And the coach said, well, why don't you just run it, but take it really easy. Don't push yourself, don't race, just run it. And so she was just the right pace for me at her sick, taking it easy pace. And then the next time she was feeling better, but I didn't know. I didn't know she was much faster than me. I didn't know she had been sick the week before. I just thought she was the right pace for me. And there was nobody in the woods to call out my time, nobody to let me know that I was running much faster than I usually did. And so I just did it. It was a moment that I realized that I was capable of doing things that I didn't think I could do, that I was capable of running much faster. And so I trained harder. And over the summer, I trained with my friends who were fast and read, ran on varsity. And then in eighth grade, I went from being so slow that people thought I had gotten lost on the course to being in the top five finishers in the junior varsity races and to being an alternate on our team that went to the state finals. And I remember that when I turned 14 in eighth grade, that was the day I broke 14 minutes. That means I ran faster than 14 minutes, which for me felt like a complete and total miracle. I never thought that I could ever run a seven minute mile, much less two sub seven minute miles in a row. That day, my friends picked me up and put me on their shoulders and carried me around like a hero, even though they could have run faster than that for, for months and months, they had been getting much faster times. They were on the varsity team, but they knew that for me, that time, while not a big deal for them, was truly a miracle, truly an impossible thing that I had accomplished. And so I'm going to talk more about what we can learn from doing impossible things in these impossible times and what blessings we can get from being a little naive but I wanted to leave everyone of all ages with that story and that image of cheering each other on and lifting each other up and celebrating what is impossible for one person.
that may not seem so hard to another. Thank you, Annie, very much. And now it is time to share our joys and concerns. And we welcome Sandy Bosanowski of the Lay Pastoral Care Team, uh, who's going to take us through uh, this. Uh, and for all those joys and concerns that we are keeping silently in our hearts, but we hear you. Thank you so much, Sandy. Thank you. John Gibbons, over to you. Good morning, everybody. And this is the time for our offering and for our offertory. And you know, as part of your ecclesiastical education, you know the difference between those two, don't you? The offering is where you are given an opportunity <clears throat> to contribute financially to First Parish, which is deeply appreciated and needed. And the offertory is the piece of music that accompanies it. And um, the offering is a piece of our free church tradition. Uh, there's nobody here but us chickens. And uh, the survival and the strength of this congregation depends on our own generosity. And again, that's deeply appreciated. Uh, this time I have words from the prophet Willie Nelson um, to introduce the offering and offertory. And Willie Nelson said, there are more serious problems in life than financial ones, and I've had a lot of those. I've been broke before and will be again. Heart broke, that's serious. Lose a few bucks, that's not. Now is an opportunity for you to lose a few bucks and for our faith community to be stronger for it. Freely we have received, freely give our offering for the work of this congregation within and far, far beyond our walls will now be gratefully received. Thank you. We shall be known by the 
Hi again, everybody. Our reading prior to Annie's sermon comes from Annie Lamott's book, Bird by Bird. Annie Lamott, you remember, spoke to packed houses back in the old days at First Parish when you had packed houses twice. She's quite remarkable and has a new book coming out quite soon. This excerpt is from her book, Bird by Bird, that is in fact about writing, but indeed about much more than writing. She says, E.L. Doctorow once said that writing a novel is like driving a car at night. You can see only as far as your headlights, but you can make the whole trip that way. You don't have to see where you're going. You don't have to see your destination or everything you will pass along the way. You just have to see two or three feet ahead of you. This is right up there with the best advice about writing or life I have ever heard. She says, I also remember a story that I know I've told elsewhere, but that over and over helps me to get a grip. 30 years ago, my older brother, who was 10 years old at the time, was trying to get a report on birds written that he'd had three months to write, but which was due the next day. We were out at our family cabin in Bolinas, and he was at the kitchen table close to tears, surrounded by binder paper and pencils and unopened books on birds, immobilized by the hugeness of the task ahead. Then my, fa then my father sat down next to him, put his arm around my brother's shoulder and said, bird by bird, buddy, just take it, bird by bird. Again, bird by bird, buddy, just take it, bird by bird. Thanks, John. So yesterday, I ran an informal half marathon. What is an informal half marathon, you ask? Well, an informal half marathon is where you and your housemates and one of your friends decides to run a 13 mile route through Boston that you plan and you have your non-running partner set up with your kid and some water and Gatorade at a couple stops along the way and you call it a half marathon. This was not the first informal half marathon I have done this pandemic, in fact. The first one was in late May. Back in January or February, I had registered for a real formal half marathon that was going to be held in late May in Providence, Rhode Island. I had signed up with my housemate. We had run half marathons before. We thought it would be fun. In March, when things started to change dramatically, I kept training. I kept training because surely by late May, things would be fine and I would be able to run a half marathon in Providence, Rhode Island. And then I kept training because, well, just on the off chance that things are fine and I can run a half marathon in Providence, Rhode Island, I want to be ready. And then I kept training out of sheer stubbornness. And then we said, well, maybe we should do a half marathon on our own. And we did. And you know where we left from? First parish in Bedford. And we ran down the Minuteman Trail into Cambridge where we ended. Yesterday, when we were running, we saw chalk markings on the ground on the trails we were on, marking finish lines and mile markers for other people's informal races that they were running. That's the thing about human beings. We can figure it out. We can figure out a new way. Last night, I had a Zoom birthday party, which I have never done before. And my friend Megan, who lives in California, was there. And I said, Megan, are you teaching? And she said, yes. And I said, but I remember in March, you said 
if we're still virtual in September, I will quit teaching. And she said, I've revised my plan. Now my plan is if we're still virtual in fall of 2021, I will quit teaching. We've all had to do a little bit of revising, haven't we? Back in March, I could see that I could handle the next week or so. Certainly not till late May, but that's okay. I only needed to see as far as the headlights shone. I didn't need to see the whole route. We were taking it bird by bird back then, and we still are. And that's often how I do things that are maybe a little bit impossible. The immigration network that I helped to form and that I am part of, the Boston Immigration Justice Accompaniment Network, once had some consultants that were hired to help us work through some of our organizational processes and they wrote up a little blurb about us and in the blurb they said that Beyond has done impressive and frankly impossible things. I thought that was funny because if we've done them, clearly they aren't impossible, but it's true. If you had told me back when I went and visited someone in immigration jail as a pastor because another organizer had asked me to, when I had a very young child and a full-time job at the UUA, if you had told me that I was going to help create and form a giant network that would become a nonprofit that would raise hundreds of thousands of dollars and bond out more than 100 people and go to thousands of court dates, I would have told you, no, 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 no. That is not something I can do at all. No way. But we didn't do that. We did it bird by bird. We did it person by person who needed some help with their case in jail. These times are impossible. These are impossible times. On Monday of this week, we had a Zoom memorial service in three different languages using the Zoom interpretation feature I had never used before. It was a memorial service for an asylum seeker and active member of our network. He had answered our detained phone. He had gone to court accompaniment. He had gotten himself and others out of immigration jail in Plymouth County. He had also died by suicide. His family was there from Mexico and two friends who he knew from immigration jail were there, one who needed Spanish and one who needed French. And we were all there on Zoom and it was impossible. His lawyers were there, his housemates who had been hosting him were there. And we all thought this cannot be. And his mother said, from Mexico in Spanish, this cannot be, and it could not be, but it was. And then on Wednesday, we lost a giant in the UU community, a UU leader who has impacted so many people. Alandria Williams died at age 41. And when I saw it on Facebook, I closed the app and I thought, if I don't look at Facebook and I go to bed, when I wake up, Alandria will be alive. But then I realized that I should probably instead go and tell my housemate, who was very close to Alandria, that another impossible thing had happened. Impossible on top of impossible. And so many people who were close to Alandria were saying, on Facebook, this cannot be. No, no, this cannot be. It is impossible. But it was. And it is impossible that we are still worshiping on Zoom. And it is impossible that our president will not accept election results. And it is impossible that we would put such a person on the Supreme Court as is being proposed. And it is impossible that you are still parenting and watching your kids do Zoom school and working from your computer. And it is impossible that we are navigating how we have to go work in person or go to school in person. And it is impossible the choices that we are faced with. 
these are deeply impossible times. But luckily, we can do impossible things. That is one of the blessings of naivete. When we don't know how long the journey will be, how fast we are running, how hard it's going to get, we can take it bird by bird. Now, I want to be clear that there are some dangers of naivete too. It is not only blessings. Now, one of those dangers may be obvious to you, and that is the danger of complacency. I do not for one minute want any of us to lean into a naivete that says things are going to be fine, so we don't have to. The coronavirus is not that big of a deal. We don't have to worry about all of this social distancing or the election will probably be fine. We don't have to make safety plans, no, no, not that kind of naivete. And there is another danger too. Back when I was in junior high cross country, there was a girl on my team named Megan Braffett and she was so fast, nobody could believe it. She won every single race she ran. When she trained with our team, she was much faster than every single person, even all of the boys. But one day, a girl from another school in town decided she was going to try. She was going to try to beat Megan Braffett. And she ran with Megan for much of the race. But at the end, she collapsed. And she crawled her way to the finish line, sick and almost unable to move, because she had pushed herself way too far. Some things really are impossible. It was not impossible for me to shave two minutes off my time. It was hard. I thought it was impossible, but it was within the limits of my body, of my spirit, of my abilities. It does not do anyone any good at all to be naive about the very real limits we have. We are humans and we are only able to do what we are able to do. So how do we harness the blessings then of the naivete while avoiding the dangers? Well, it's tricky. I screw it up a lot. Sometimes I take on more things than I can do and I don't do them. Other times I don't do the hard thing because I think it's too hard. But I think the best way is to do two simple things, simple and hard. One is to train. The only reason I could make that race was because I was training all the time, running all the time. If we want to be able to do hard things, we've got to practice. If we want to be able to be loving in really stressful circumstances, then we have to practice being loving in stressful circumstances every day. And if we want to be able to be brave when there's a coup, then we've got to practice being brave every single day. And if we want to be able to model self-care and boundaries, then we got to practice it with every little piece of our lives. The second thing is that we have to listen to our bodies. We have to know where the hard limits are and not push past them, not collapse onto the ground sick and a mess. We have to get better at being still enough to listen and find in ourself, is this something that is hard that I can do or something that is too hard? And then we may need to ask for help or we may need to say no, and that may feel awful and we may let people down and it's better than collapsing. So I want you all to spend a few minutes and you can do some journaling or some quiet reflection, but we're also going to sort you into breakout rooms if you like to process with others. So you can opt into the breakout room or just don't if you are not a breakout room person. But I want you to think about this question, what have I been training for? What have I been training for? So that I can do something that is almost impossible. Maybe you have been training yourself in staying entertained in isolation and engaging your own mind when you are disconnected from others. 
maybe you've been training in that courage, that courage to go and stand out publicly with your values when it makes you nervous. Maybe you've been training in saying no. Maybe you've been training in taking on a little more. So whatever you've been training in, I want you to do a little reflection with others or with yourself on that question. How, what have I been training for so that I can do impossible things? We'll come. Wonderful. We'll have some closing music from the UU uh, group, Emma's Revolution, to move us forward into our closing words. <laughs>